All right. Let's begin. My name is Michael Case. I uh, work with Kira Consulting. We're a small consulting group, kind of scattered about six different time zones, There's 10 of us. A uh, large number of us are either boost authors or maintainers. Um, we like to, uh, to write code all throughout the stack. So on any particular day, we're writing code inside of an MCU, no operating system. Maybe it's got 4K of RAM. And after lunch, we're dealing with um, issues inside of one of the server farms that has you know eight or nine hundred cores and dealing with um, distributed systems that we have with these internet devices where there's a hundred thousand of them scattered about through the US and so we're we like to just solve problems and deal with things all over the place and so um, some of you I recognize and you've heard me speak about other things like spirit and metaprogramming and and things that have probably in your mind at least nothing to do with embedded systems um, but uh, embedded systems are kind of near and dear to me. I happen to be a double E. I don't try to say that too loud at this conference. Um, but you know, I, uh, we call it honest work, the type of work that you do and you can explain to your mom and she understands what you just said. That's honest work, right? So you get done trying to explain this amazing, cool algorithm you worked on. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, all right, so what is MQTT? So this, this discussion is about embedded MQTT on C++ 14 library. We're gonna try, try to tear that apart, what, what all that means at the moment. Um, the reality is this, this talk is really not so much about the MQTT client library as it is about uh, an approach I took to write a client library in C++ 14 on a small embedded device. And that's what I'm hoping you're here to hear about and, and take something away from. Um, so, uh, MQTT used to mean message queue telemetry transport. Nobody actually uses that anymore. They just call it MQTT um, because it's kind of like old days when there were things like trunk lines and stuff, right? Um, it is an ISO standard. It basically is a publish subscribe type model and um, it's considered lightweight. It does require a reliable connection, so that's one of the, the things that it depends upon. It depends upon whatever this connection is to be reliable. Um, let's take a look at kind of the basic idea here. We have a broker. The broker is the centralized point in which the different clients will connect. In this diagram, we have these five different clients. And the clients connect into the broker, they subscribe or they publish topics. And um, as they do, so then those topics get routed to, um, the published topics get routed to the subscribers that wanted to, to know about it. Um, up here we have this toaster, and toaster is subscribing to town plant toaster um, hash. And the hash is, uh, the pound sign is um, a wild card, and it basically means uh, any other topics that exist. So, we have topic separators. The topic separators are the forward slash. They allow us kind of this concept of like pathing. And um, by using the hash mark, it says uh, replace in up to indifferent possibilities. So we'll match anything that starts with town plant toaster. All right. And then over here, we've got the, uh, the new plant power, and it's subscribing to town plant. And then the plus means a single replacement. So that's a wild card for just a single, a single thing in that spot. Um, power control, so that's what it would like. And um, over down here we have a switch, switch number one, and switch number one is going to publish, and it's publishing to town plant toaster power underscore control, and it's publishing a data that is on. Um, so this matches, of course, what the toaster wanted, um, because it matches that first part. So the toaster turns on, but unfortunately it also matches the power plant, so the nuclear power plant comes on at the same time as the toaster, probably was not expected, might be fun, I don't know. Um, this is the basic idea, though, of MQTT, um, just passing messages around. There's, um, there's a lot more involved inside the broker. John has actually a talk later this week, he's gonna be talking about building a broker, um, so if you're interested in that type of thing, um, go to John's talk. And um, a lot of the the smarts of MQTT is inside of the broker and what it's supposed to do when clients reconnect um, to the safe state or whatnot. Basic messages in MQTT are very simple. There is a connect, disconnect, connect, subscribe, unsubscribe, publish, and ping. That's it. 
there's nothing else you can really do with these things. So very limited set of messaging, and um, this will provide then all the capabilities we need. The publish, um, publish is sent from the subscriber to the broker. Publish is actually what's received also to the client when a topic comes in. They use the same message for both sending and receiving. Um, there are three levels of quality of service. QoS zero um, is at most once delivery, so I'm just gonna deliver and or send a message, and I don't really care to know if it's been acknowledged or not. Um, at least once delivery, I'm going to keep on some periodic timer um, sending the message until I receive an act, so there might be another in flight, and uh, the, the other end might receive more than one. And then there is uh, exactly once and uh, QoS level three. There is a very complicated handshake sequence that will determine whether or not uh, another's been received or if one's in flight or whatnot, and so you only end up with one. <clears throat> MQTT has been used in a lot of different things. Amazon uses it in their Internet of Things. Lots of people just, you know, that's yet the next buzzword, Internet of Things, right? Um, and so uh, you'll see MQTT either disguise as something or extend it. RabbitMQ extends it and uses it as something else. Um, and it kind of, it's been around and it exists in a variety of different applications. Facebook Messenger is another one, yeah, MQTT. So it's not, um, not just this weird thing that I dreamt up. It's, it's real. Um, all right, so what's embedded? Uh, so we kind of got an idea what MQTT is, but what is this embedded thing? So this is always fun. What's embedded? This is uh, the interactive part of the class. <laughs> Ooh, not your com traditional computer interface. Okay, yeah, that pretty much just covered everything. <laughs> you guys are like, no fun. <laughs> All right, any examples of what might fall in that classification? Nobody. Microcontrollers. Okay, small microcontrollers. Um, so small microcontrollers might have uh, two or four K of RAM. Uh, we actually, uh, work on a product line for a medical company. The, the product line actually has 4K of RAM and it deals with um, wireless communications with a bunch of different things. Pardon me? Toasters. Yeah, toasters. <laughs> toasters. Okay, cell phones. Are cell phones embedded? Yeah. Why? Really? Yeah, see? Yeah, there's this. So there are parts of the cell phone that. Uh, okay, at some level, they're an embedded device. What's weird is, if we had this discussion 10 years ago, yeah. it would be really easy. Um, or 15 years ago, it would be super easy back then. You know, It's like, we knew what embedded devices were. Um, and as time has moved on, embedded devices and the concept of an embedded device has kind of morphed around a little bit, right? So uh, something can have a gig of RAM on it and running a full operating system and you know be much more powerful than any machine I ever saw when I was in college and be in my pocket and I'll call it an embedded device. And so embedded has a fairly different um, connotation when we think about the physical device, but they have a lot of the same qualities that we're always looking for. We're looking for power constraints. We're looking for um, portability, typically. Um, the, the device often has some type of time requirements associated with it, not always. Um, but I, I think the term has become fuzzed. So while we'll maybe want to argue after the session about what embedded means, for now, we're just going to assume embedded is whatever you want it to be, okay? Um, okay, but this part everybody agrees on that you know the world in general, you're going to put C++ on an embedded device? What are you thinking? That is nuts, that's completely crazy. People don't do that. People don't put C++ on embedded devices. And um, just to kind of point it out, um, I was preparing to talk about this, this in May at um, BoostCon or CPB Now, and uh, the day that I decided that I was gonna speak on this subject, this came across the Twitter feed. And this is like a perfect diagram of why people don't want to put, mentally, they don't want to put C++ on embedded devices. Now this happens to be the standard library and vector, but um, there's a belief, a feeling that it's just gonna be bloated 
it's going to be large. Uh, it's not going to fit. Performance is going to be poor. Um, and so I decided, you know, I'm going to ask everybody in the world that I know, as far as I can tell, everybody who is in the world must be on Twitter, right? Is that how that works? I don't know. I asked, what are the top four reasons um, to not put it on, use it on embedded, embedded targets? And uh, we get things like uh, more complicated regulatory approvals. Um, so our company does embedded work on things that are on FAA certified devices and FDA certified devices. So I don't know that it's more complicated. Um, but smaller developer pool, that's definitely a real problem. Uh, bloated binaries, we're going to disprove, I hope. And um, this is what, what this person's heard, right? Uh, how about this one? Uh, programmers going wild creating too many levels of abstraction. I mean, the keynote yesterday, that's the whole idea, is that <laughs> we can um, be very close to the hardware and manipulate the hardware and the bits as needed, yet we can have zero cost abstractions. And I hope by the end of this session you'll see that, yeah, we truly can have some zero cost abstractions. They'll help us out. All right, uh, so general public devices don't do it. We, we should not use um, C++ on embedded, but we're not gonna listen to them. We're rebels. Um, okay, so why do we need yet one more uh, MQTT library? There are several MQTT libraries out there um, under a variety of different open source packages or you can get commercial versions. Um, and like, why do we need yet one more? Uh, so in, in December, I was working on a project that needed an MQTT client and thought I was going to be using actually an open source MQTT client. And after taking a look um, at, at the particular one we thought we were going to use and then a few others, they all had the same problem, which here's a message sequence chart that kind of describes it. From the user point of view or the program that's using the client, the MQTT client, it's going to say something like subscribe. Well, subscribe is something that needs to be sent off to the broker, the subscription. It needs to get a sub act back, and then it will return the QS level that was um, provided for the subscription. This is a blocking call. It's like I call subscribe, and the client doesn't return until I get my QoS level back. This is like, I don't know, some server farm somewhere else. My cell phone might not even be connected, and I'm going to time out. It's just. This is not how I want to deal with embedded. Uh, when I'm dealing with embedded type work, I want to deal inside of an environment that is event driven, uh, almost always. So I want something that's like this. I'm going to send a subscribe, and it's going to get to the broker, but I'm going to receive some type of an event back that's telling me I got my subscription ACK. Uh, meanwhile, I can perform cycles on something else. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we need a different MQTT library, something that was event-driven, that allowed me to, to treat this thing asynchronously. Uh, so blocking's a problem, dependency injection, um, event notification, and execute um, executors, or executors. Um, so we'll see what an executor is in a second, too. Uh, talk about event notification. When, um, in MQTT, when something says that, yep, I received the message, I don't care if the client received the message. I want to care about whether or not the application received the message. That's actually really the QS level I care about, right? It's not that the communication layer received it. The app received it. And so that seemed to be lacking also. Um, all right, so how about these other two things? Well, uh, if we think about this as being the client, uh, it, it might be that I don't want to use TCP for my connection. I just need a connection that provides bytes. Whatever I can do to provide bytes back and forth, that qualifies as a connection. It could be a serial device, it could be a Bluetooth device, it could be all kinds of different things as long as I can reliably be sending communication back and forth. And so I want to be able to inject what the communication mechanism is back and forth to the client. I also want to be able to inject the um, executor. How is it that I'm going to think about um, the asynchronous activities that are occurring. At the end of the day, this might just um, fall apart into some main loop that's running, right? A main event loop. That's super common. Depending upon what, what device you're using, you might have this set up as you're receiving timed events, 
And so you've got actually an event pool of some sort, and timers are going off, waking the chip back up. You go and do a couple things, you go back to sleep. So there are things that are already going to um, provide me this concept of an executor. I'd rather go ahead and inject that into the client library when, um, when I decide what that's going to be. There's a lot going on um, with this poor little guy. He's got to, um, users are going to want to subscribe, uh, the client might be in the middle of a publish to the broker. The broker might be in the middle of sending a pub act back. The client might have already received actually a publish coming in and now needs to transfer that over to the user. There might be some timeout from a connection that's going on. There are a lot of different events that this needs to handle. And some of them are dependent. For example, establishing a connection with the broker. You have to establish the physical connection with the broker, ensure that it's actually working. Um, excuse me, the, the logical connection. And then you need to communicate to the broker, so there's some negotiation that needs to go on. And if you had some um, subscribes that were already, excuse me, subscribes, yeah, that were already queued up, you need to send those out. And so you can imagine this is like this, do this, and then do this, and then do this. You might be tempted to like take a future and have continuations, but anywhere along the line, something bad might happen, and how are you gonna tear the continuation apart cleanly um, it starts to get a little hairy, and what you're really doing is you're writing a state machine using continuations. You probably shouldn't do that. At least I don't think you should do that. Uh, I think you should do state machines. So we're gonna use a hierarchical state machine instead to deal with the state activities. We just want to, the state machine only to deal with states, and then to delegate back up the actual functional activities to some normal function we can, we can think about. So, um, if we kind of blur our eyes and pretend, uh, our client kind of has this not connected to, it's connected to the broker, eventually, um, I'm sorry, connect to broker, it, then it finally is connected, then it's shutting down, and then it's not connected again. Um, so this might be the high level concepts. And where connect broker then is another machine, and it's negotiating with the broker, it's waiting for the connection act, if it doesn't get it, then it times out, it does a retry count, whether or not it can do it again, and so forth. So we can think about uh, this, each of these states becoming other additional states, hierarchical states in this process. Um, I like hierarchical state machines myself because it lets me handle error handling at different levels of the hierarchy. Um, it's very clean. I know whether or not I've met all the cases. I don't have regulatory problems because I can prove that I'm not going to deal, I, I've dealt with all the state transitions that I needed to. Um, it's obvious what the state is in my program. So we're gonna do that. So in May when this occurred, I went over to um, uh, Kira leases um, some, some space from uh, a company that we partnered with um, for a long time, about eight years. They have uh, pick and place machines and, and CNC machines and so they're, there's kind of the R&D side that takes care of all the physical bits and pieces, and sync labs, and I went on over and I said, hey, what do you have that, um, that I might borrow that maybe has Bluetooth on it? And they had this thing, this had a Nordic chip on it, um, and they had just brought it up, they had put um, a little sample application on it, and I said, can I, can I steal one of those? And one was coming off the pick and place line, it uh, had not been tested yet. They said, sure, you can take this one. So I took it. and. Um, I thought, this will be perfect. They gave me the code. I've got this little device. This is the Nordic device. Um, we're not gonna worry about that one. That's something else that they use it for. I didn't care about it. I just really wanted the Bluetooth off of it. This, you know, these are the specs, not so much embedded for some people in their world, but uh, it worked for what I wanted because I just wanted some communication mechanism that wasn't TCP. So this is what the original test app did that that we grabbed from them at the same time. They had an application, there's this um, proprietary communication layer that they had that was speaking BLE to a phone and it was displaying um, the accelerometer uh, values as well as the temperature on the device. Okay, it didn't, didn't do much, but my job now was to figure out, can I take that and just drop in this C++ MQTT library, wedge that in, so that I have this. I've got the MQTT client. The application, which was C, now needs to compile under a C++ compiler. And can I just kind of drop in this without being too intrusive what the original thing looked like? Um, for the, the 
bit in the middle, we're just going to write a proxy. So the Bluetooth is being proxied over to the TCP to an MQTT broker and back and forth. So it's not really doing anything except for being this proxy between TCP and whatnot. All right, um, got some help from uh, Augustine and uh, Yarun. They usually get roped into helping me out a little bit somewhere along the line. We just call it being sniped. Um, all right, so step one. Step one is to get the code just to compile with the C++ compiler, right? And uh, how many of you have done that before? You've got some C code and you're trying to get to, did you give up or did you like, did you stick with it? I stuck with it. All right, you stuck with it, good. It, it, can, it can be hard, right? Um, but along the way, um, hopefully you end up making a lot, um, a lot of improvements to clean that code up. And here's an example of a piece of code that was in there that, that the compiler forced us to clean up. We didn't have a choice. It had to get cleaned. And the reason, we've got this uh, uh, OLED write. It's going to take a pointer to some number of bytes, or pointer to bytes, and a count of how many bytes that will be um, be part of this array of bytes. And this is the calling lines. Uh, we, we can't do this in C++. This is a temporary value that's being passed um, by non-cons. There are lots of things that are actually problems here that the compiler is just going to complain about. Not only that, it's totally unsafe, right? We are taking the number of bytes that we're sending and sticking that as a parameter. So they're, they're just going to get out of sync. So we look at this right away, and we're like, OK, well, in C++14, I have a perfectly good way to write this already. So let's do that. My perfectly good way is I'm, I'm just going to actually use initializer lists. Because initializer lists are const expressions. I can create one of them. I, it knows its size. And I've got this little wrapper here that's going to take initializer list. It's going to call the original version of the write, passing it the begin, which gets a pointer to the type and uh, the, the size. Um, all right, so this now, from a user point of view, the code has become cleaner, safer. Uh, it's got this, I, I made it const here because we're trying to be friendly with our constness, but it's got this ugly little const cast. And at some point, um, when you're interfacing to C libraries, you're going to end up with that. You don't, you don't get upset about it. You just write it and move on, OK? It should be at the very bottom layers. Now, what do you think the overhead is of doing this? What should the overhead be of doing this? Zero. Zero, right. So zero overhead to do this, right? So we were able to take and just use initializer list, have no overhead at all. So that's good. We're starting to get what we want. Now, we finally got it to compile. And my C++14 version was uh, just slightly larger than the C99 version. Not too surprising. Um, both of them are large. This is the entire application that they had provided. Um, so I spent a little bit of time trying to figure out, well, what can we do just with some switches? So the first thing is, well, I'm never going to use run type, type information, so let's just turn that off. And that had no effect. But actually, I'm not going to use exceptions either. So I'm going to turn those off too. And when you hear people complain, like, oh, you embedded guy is complaining about exceptions all the time. I mean, this is me with my embedded hat on, by the way, as opposed to me with the other hat that I have to wear most of the time. So, um, that's 5K. Let's put that in perspective. I had 32K on this device. That's a sixth of my memory, and I haven't done anything. I haven't called an exception. There are no exceptions in this code yet. This is just exception support. That's a really hefty price to pay for something that I, I don't really probably want to use. What, what happens when you have an exception in your system and things go bad? I mean, if this is a medical device, what are you going to do, right? I mean, you don't know your state. That's why you threw an exception at that point. You're not trying to recover. You're trying to put yourself in a state um, which is as safe as possible so that hardware interlocks can kick in, watchdogs can reboot you. Something else is going to happen, right? And, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. What we do inside of Kiara is we actually use um, the boost exception throw. And in the process of doing that, we actually assign a global handler. So when exceptions are turned off, we just make the same call all the time, as, we're th as if we're throwing an exception. So when exceptions are turned off, the handler then receives then this call. And then it says, oh, there was an exception in the system, and we just, just handle it. So there's still what appears to be a very clean 
uh, mechanism, but there's no exception. So I got my 5K back. I bet I can figure out a better place to use that than, um, than exceptions at the moment. The other thing I noticed right away was uh, it was being compiled in 03. I actually don't care about speed. I care about size. Size is a big deal to me. So right away just turned on size optimization. And now the C++ result for the text is smaller than the C99. That is not actually surprising. Uh, it's what I would expect. And I'm glad it happened because it makes the slide better. Um, so you know, the optimizer in C++14 is just superior. So we're going to get better size optimization. All right, so let's move on now. Um, what happens with an empty main? Mains with nothing in them. And I'm on an even playing field. So C99 and C++14, I've, I've got it all configured and tuned enough that I've got pretty much the same starting basis. So it'll be anything bad that happens after this point is my problem. All right. Now, I decided also, I'm just going to go wild. Why not? I'm going to start using vectors and strings. Now notice, I'm using this MQTT vector, an MQTT string. It's not something that I would normally do on an embedded device. This, this device, we're not running any operating system. Um, so it doesn't really have heap management. Not really, right? It's got some pool manager somewhere that's taking care of that. Um, and you would probably not call um, you would not use a vector and you would not use strings normally. And I just decided, let's see what the overhead is. Because at the end of the day, the interface of a standard string and the interface of a standard vector is a perfectly reasonable interface. So I can write something else that adapts to it. The other thing that's very common in embedded is you write your own allocator and you just pass that in. So it would not be abnormal for us to have, in the past, with C++03, to write an allocator, pass it into the client, MQTT client, and then that would then be utilized everywhere inside of the client that we needed a standard container. Uh, that's so ugly. So uh, let's not do that anymore. So there's, here's the, um, the definitions of uh, string and vector. But if I needed to make my own allocator, thanks to now C++11 and uh, aliases, type aliases, I can write something like this one. We'll look at the, the vector one. I can write something where now the vector, the T is here, but I can actually specify that it's my allocator. And I couldn't do that before. So 11 allows me to do something like this. Uh, this is our first time trying it on a project. It seemed to work out pretty well, actually. So um, we've got some small modifications we might make about how to define the allocator so that we can just define an allocator for everything. But this is a, I think this is a neat trick as opposed to in the past in, in embedded development, we used to try to push allocators down. Um, so putting a string in there, what did it cost me? It cost me 364 bytes in text, not so bad. So we're gonna keep strings. Now, what does a client look like? Um, the client itself, um, it's gonna have a type of the connection and the um, executor. It's going to have this publish handler um, which will default to this handler type. We could have stored this. When uh, the client receives a message coming in, it has to make a call back up into the application saying, hey, I received a topic. I've got a message. Um, this could have been maybe a, um, a polymorphic function object, but I'm, I'm not that um, crazy yet. So um, this type def could still be a polymorphic function object, but for right now, we're just going to make it a known type. Um, the other things that we're going to store in here, this client interface, we're going to come back to this in a moment. Uh, this is going to be important. And the uh, identifier of what the client is, and here is the state machine itself, so the hierarchical state machine. Uh, and we've got some other methods. Uh, connect, disconnect, subscribes, unsubscribes, set the publish handler, publish um, under some variety of things. And you can see some of them are templatized. Now, there, there are two ways to think about templates. Um, if you have the hat on where you're writing metaprograms or some other type of weird thing with templates, you have the hat on and you, and you think about templates as being pattern matching. That's the best way to think about templates. They're pattern matching. But when I'm writing embedded code, I have to think about templates, especially if it's not compile time only things, I have to think about templates as code generation. That's where the code bloat's gonna come from, right? So if I, if I would have to write code that would perform that same functionality with the different signatures and just to, in order to make the thing work, it was a requirement, then writing it as a template is good. But if I write it as a template just to, because I'm lazy and I end up with code bloat, that's bad. 
And we'll see an example here in a moment of hopefully bad versus good. Now, what does the constructor look like? So the constructor is taking the different types that are coming in. It's going to initialize these submachines, and it's going to start the machine running. Um, initializing the submachines, it's passing the, the client machine. So this is the top level state machine. And it's passing um, and the address to the client interface. And this is going to be important in a little bit. Imagine we've got these hierarchical state machines. We want the state machines to deal only with state transition information. And then when they have to perform some task, we want them to call into a function that's got the functionality somewhere. Somehow we have to tell them where that functionality is. There's not any way, cool way to do that otherwise. This is what the state machines are going to look like. It's basically a struct. Um, we're going to use boost meta state machine. And um, we have to associate it with some back end. And this is why I like MSM, because when I'm thinking about a state machine, I want to think about state machines as state tables. So here is the start, or this is the uh, state that I'm in. This is the event that's going to cause the transition. This is the state that I'm going to end up in. This is the action that might be performed on the transition as it occurs. And then are there any guards? Each of these things in the table are a type. So this is basically a list of type lists. And it's all compile time magic. MSM is going to take care of that. Um, and it's going to produce at compile time, it'll take it some time to do this, but it will produce a very, very efficient state machine. Um, now, it's going to produce a very efficient state machine from runtime speed, but unfortunately, it had more code bloat than I thought it should. And Christoph and I have been talking about um, how we can use 14 constructs to take care of some of that. I don't know if we'll get to it very soon, but um, a lot of these things could be fixed now with 14. All right, so we've got, how do we write now the states inside of a state machine? Well, the states inside the state machine are actually just uh, types again. So like we had here, not connected, connect broker. So not connected is a state. We're gonna inherit from uh, state and um, the States can have entry code and exit code, and so we're going to write that as methods on entry. Um, now, the FSM inside of the MSM library, FSM is a reference to the machine. So if we have hierarchical machines, it's a reference to whatever the machine is that you currently belong in. And this client was that thing that we initialized it with, that we haven't quite seen what the magic was for that, but we, in, we just called some machines and we initialized it so that we can call things like update connection status. So when I'm not connected, I'm gonna update the connection status to disconnected. Here, I'm, when I come into connected, I'm gonna be connected, and when I'm leaving connected, I'm no longer connected, so that I must be disconnecting. So that's the exit code. Um, when I'm shutting down, so when I'm shutting down, uh, if I get a connect message as I'm in the middle of a shutdown, that's not a problem, that's just something I have to defer, I wanna deal with later. And so inside of MSM I can state, these are the list of events that I want to defer until the next state, and it will take care of that for me. All right, um, so then we have actions. Now notice send packet is the same action for each of these uh, different events that are going to occur. And so what is that? Well, it's a type, and it then has the callable operator that's overloaded for each of the, um, each of the event types. And so when it is a publish out, it's gonna do this. Um, unsubscribe, it's gonna do that and so forth. So you can see that the code inside the state machine is just trying to handle state only and then delegate activity elsewhere. Um, and then at some point in the state machine, we say we have submachines. These are all the submachines we have. This is a type list. And what our initial state is. When you come up, this is where I want you to begin, not connected. All right. So, Stop just for a second. This is the interface I want. The interface I want is dealing with types, and I want to deal with um, being able just to say like the initial state is not connected, and I want to deal with saying I have these sub-state machines. This is the list of the sub-state machines, and I don't really want to deal with um, any, any initialization of those. I want to somehow magically initialize those. Does 
that makes sense? Um, so now what we're about ready to see is something that would be like below, below your normal place where you would be operating. Uh, this is lifted out of Lauden, which is a distributed state machine um, library that we use inside the company uh, that we wrote. And um, what we have are things like transition tables. Um, they, uh, they are a list of, of types. And then submachines, well, this is a also list of types. And, um, and all of this is getting ready, this submachine thing that we said, just this list of types, it's getting ready so that we can take care of um, setting this client underscore that we just saw used. Client underscore score comes from the base that we inherited from. And I want to be able to set that for all of the different submachines along the way. Well, what is client interface? So here's one of the problems with doing embedded and where code bloat comes from. You remember at the very top, the client itself is specialized on the connection, the executor, and the callback type. As a result, those types have to get propagated to everything that wants to understand how to talk back up to it. And we can end up with all this bloat that's occurring because there are types that that are being generated in the system that we may not actually need. In fact, we don't need them because um, notice the types of things that the state machine wants to do. It wants to send messages to the broker, receive from the broker, queue tasks, update connection status. It wants to do this send. None of these things need to know about that other information at all. And so if we can somehow separate the type system that's up in the client where we care about it and we're going to implement the actual functionality, uh, the functions themselves, from the state machine that doesn't care about it, then we're going to actually be able to reduce um, the number of types inside of our system, which then at the end of the day will reduce the code bloat. One way of doing that is something that's called type erasure. And poor man type erasure is just using virtual functions. So I've got some vir virtual functions here for these different these different things. And now I have this client interface wrapper, and it will go ahead and implement these. And that's what glues things back together. Because the state machines can't know about the types, yet somehow they need to communicate to something that actually has the type associated with it, the client. And so we're going to use type erasure to, to break these apart. Um, and now this is where it's being stored. Here's the connection, and here's the um, executor. The, those two are being stored in here. This is implementing the interface itself. That provides that erasure. Um, all right. So here's that magic thing, this initialized submachines. Keep in mind, this is all like, this is the library stuff that we're just using. But what's going on underneath the hood? And the reason we want to look at this is because we're going to use some abstraction layers. We just did. This is a huge abstraction for a whole bunch of work. Um, now, let's look and see what that work is that is being abstracted away and whether or not we actually had any penalty from it. Um, all right. So initialize submachines. This here is the machine coming in. This is the interface I want to implement. I'm going to assign the interface to that machine's client. And then I'm going to initialize the submachines. Um, uh, excuse me. I'm going to to get another type, um, this impl, and um, I'm going to call descend on the machine type and apply it. Now, um, inside of the meta state machine, everything is a type, and types can be associated with other types, and there are other metaprogram things to figure out what the subtypes are. Um, I want to be able then to use that and that's what this is. This initialized submachine now is going to, through its operator and getting the submachine types, it's going to assign the interface and then descend again into the next one. And now this is the, the descend that's occurring. What's happening is the code, generator, the code generation that's occurring from the template metaprogramming is finding the types for all the different submachines that are existing, setting the client to it, looking at those types that it just found for the submachines. Do they have any lists associated with them for submachines, generating code, descending back down, generating code, descending back down, um, over and over again. So 
what does that look like? Well, descend is some you know, funky metaprogram thing with this meta for each um, and an apply. Um, so it is going to take the, for each of the submachines that are in the type list, it's going to execute the thing that was passed in, that function. Um, here is the rest of, uh, somewhere we have to um, terminate it because it's this recursive call, so here's the specialization to terminate. Uh, that's the meta list, that's how we write meta type lists anymore. Um, size was one of the things that we needed to know. Well, size is nothing more than calling the size of for the ellipse type, so that gets us for the, um, the, uh, the type list, gets us how many of them there were. Um, we don't have time to make it through all of this. What I want you to see is there's a lot under the hood going on in order to build this for us, to give us this clean abstraction. We've got a for each that's doing some, this is a metaprogramming for each. Here's the detail for that for each, which is playing some tricks and expanding stuff out. So um, some of you have been in some, one, one or more of my classes on C++ 14 and 11. You've, you've seen this trick, right? So we are uh, we're, have a very attic template. We're expanding out the list here and then uh, doing nothing with it just so this thing will execute. Um, with just the parent, if there were no substate machines, all of that code went away. It resulted in no increase at all. With one submachine, I got 28 bytes of text. Well, that's probably very close to what was needed anyhow to, set the to make the call and set the client. It's not a whole lot more than that. Um, adding additional submachines had very small increase, almost none. So, uh, I have now this great abstraction layer, right? Not something that you would write every single time, but I've created this abstraction so that at, I can think about problems at a higher level. It's doing a bunch of stuff under the hood, so I have that abstraction. I didn't pay for it. That's exactly why we want to use this language, right? So I've got a better abstraction to deal with. It didn't cost me anything. Um, all right, so here we go. We've got some types. Uh, uh, if you've been, did, did any of you go to um, Ben Dean's talk on types? Okay, one. So, you know, the idea of using the type system to help you, it's probably a good idea. So we're going to use types to represent the different messages. So we've got these different types. These are bidirectional ones, publish, pubback. They've got some data inside of them that represent then what goes along with that message that would be delivered back and forth. Um, here's from the server to the client. These are the messages that it exists, that exist there. And Bam, you know, this looks like a variant to me. This X3 is, is, a, um, is a variant that's inside of Spirit, inside of Boost. So we're just going to use that one. It lets us make objects more easily, recursive objects. Um, we don't have any recursion here, but we've got a type now, this variant that can hold any of our um, message types. So control packet can hold any type that represents the messaging that's going back and forth. All right. Um, so once we have all this cool stuff, well, we might as well do fusion adaption. And so what fusion adaption is for, uh, for those who don't know what fusion is, fusion lets us um, deal with, it's, it is a library for dealing with tuples. Think of it that way. So by doing adaptions, it lets me non-intrusively adapt and, and explain that these structs look like these tuples references to tuples. And that gives me some magic that we're going to use in a little bit. Now, if I was to parse this stuff, I could write a parser like this, right? And I'm in the header state, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to be inside the length, and then I'm going to do this, and then a body. You know, we all, we all have written parsers like this before, right? OK. So um, that would be one way to do it. Here's what the header reading might look like. Um, forming the packet might look like something like that. Notice it's like based upon the type that's going on. I've got to do something a little bit different each time. Oh, here it was actually the sub act packet, so I'm actually going to do this bit, right? We've we've seen parsing like this in C code. Well, went through all that other work, and it wouldn't be a good talk that I gave unless I talked about Spirit somewhere. So we're going to write Spirit code instead. 
Spirit is an embedded domain-specific language that allows us to write something that looks like EB and F, it's actually PEG, for um, parsing grammars. So what this says is um, a control packet is this literal byte 40 followed by a pub ack, or it's a 10 followed by a publish, or it's a 20 followed by a conac, and so forth. Uh, so this is now declarative. It's this thing followed by that other thing. Well, uh, what is the definition of sub -ack? Well, it is we're going to skip the encoded length followed by a big word followed by zero or more quality of service messages that came in. Uh, what is the quality of service? Well, this ends up being, uh, at th first I thought a problem, because <laughs> I selected for my quality of service uh, an enumerated class. And so you can't just like shove in integer values and have them convert. You actually need to be very explicit. But the reality is being very explicit, it's a good thing, right? It can only, in the grammar in fact, it can only be one of those. It can't be anything else. It's an error in fact, if it's anything other than that. So I got like this built-in type check. Now, type safety. Um, so going through, we've got pub act, con act. You can see that reading this is better than my case statements galore. This is declarative. It looks like what the grammar should be, something followed by something else. Um, so now, what's the cost of all this thing, right? The spirit grammars and the composition of all that along with it does all the error checking, which I didn't have, by the way, inside of the other bit, cost me just barely over 3K. So the way I'm looking at this is I traded exception handling for a declarative grammar that has um, the, the built-in um, error handling already for me. That seems like a pretty good trade. Um, and then I still have two more K I can do something with. Just have to figure it out. Yeah, the reason is all compile time magic. So the spirit grammar, we write this um, domain-specific embedded thing. Those types are going to make more types, and eventually the compiler is going to take all of that and make the parser for us. And because, um, because it happens at compile time, the compiler can see a lot of things that are happening, and it will optimize that to um, a really high degree. Right, no RTTI is enabled. That is correct. Um, all right, so the takeaway from all of those slides in which your eyes were starting to glaze over, we, speakers hate the after lunch spot. We call it the nap spot. <laughs> so the, um, the takeaway from all of that was we wrote a whole bunch of code, including Spirit. So the reason I did Spirit is just because we help maintain Spirit. The Joel de Guzman, who's the author of Spirit, works with works for Kira, and you know, so we do a lot of spirit, and it was like one of those, I, I wonder what will happen, it's mostly so that I could like poke Joel and say, it didn't work on my little embedded device. The reality is actually just this last week, somebody got it running um, on their, um, uh, what was it, little app melt chips, everybody's all excited about, Adrenos. They had it running on an Adreno, so I thought, well, that's pretty neat. The takeaway from all that, though, is don't try to be smarter than the compiler. Just don't. See what happens, right? Give it a try, especially if it is um, heavy metaprogramming stuff, because the compiler actually has visibility to things that it wouldn't otherwise have visibility to, and it can optimize things that if you just had function call, function call, function call, it doesn't know what to do with that, right? But if Along the way, it had to instantiate these to figure it out. It has complete visibility all the way through the, the, the um, stack trace. It's going to do something possibly different. Um, all right. So uh, we could do, this is the last bit that we want to talk about. Um, so if, you don't want to serialize this way. But if you were to think about how do I serialize stuff going back out, I, I, in essence, I have an algorithm of things that have to happen. I've got to figure out the length of these messages going out, their variable length. I've got to figure out that length. Eventually, I've got to figure out the packet size. It's going to be associated with the variable length and some other math. I've got to figure out, oh, I've got to get a buffer to put that stuff in. And then I actually need to serialize into that buffer um, and then return it. We're just going to say those are the steps we have to perform. Now, those are the steps we have to perform kind of regardless of what the message is. 
Uh, this is a good place for a template because I'd have to actually write these steps or in essence the equivalent of those steps into a call, right? One way or the other because these are each unique based upon the t-type. So this is a really good place to use templates. I'd ha I'm gonna let the compiler generate the code for me instead of me making more code paths. And not only that, uh, the compiler's probably gonna be a little bit smart for me. Um, here is what would happen if I was doing a subscribe. I've actually got some real work that I have to do, all right? So I write that work. Um, this is the impl, the uh, impl here. Um, so I write that real work. Well, what, how about if I am, uh, how about if I'm doing variable packet length for a ping request? Well, ping request actually doesn't have any variable packet length at all. So this is going to be a constant expression. It returns zero. Do you think that the compiler can probably figure out that the variable length is zero here? Yeah, right, it's a constant expression, right? So it's gonna be able to figure out the zero. Do you think the compiler can figure out how to add zero in a bunch of numbers that it already knows? Yeah, it can figure that out at compile time, right? So the compiler is going to do the work for you. These things aren't going to happen because it can figure this out at compile time. Serialize um, the impl for the ping request. Mm, it probably can figure this out too fairly well. So to the point that this call provides, um, it ends up not producing a lot of code. Um, so pick your types correctly, use const expression when it's actually a constant expression, help the compiler along. All right, so some conclusions. Templates are not evil, all right? You need to think about the fact that they're code generators, probably, when you're doing something like that, those last set of slides we just saw, that's generating new code for each type. It has to instantiate that and all the stuff that's down below. Uh, you can take advantage of that or it's going to produce bloat. So just be careful about it when you go. Um, know what you are doing with templates. So spend a little bit of time using them and figuring them out. They're, they're a good thing to help you um, not have to write as much code. Uh, determine your level of embedded. Look, if, if you're targeting some large device, um, don't make life hard on yourself, right? Just go use the whole standard library. Have at it. Use the standard, li standard containers to start with. So uh, standard containers have been well thought out. They have great interfaces. You can implement something that takes up a whole lot less room utilizing that same interface. So just start off with the interface you want and then change the back end if you need to. Uh, type aliases are a great tool to do that. Uh, don't outthink your compiler. Um, all right, so we, we finally gave this thing a name um, because I like coffee. Uh, it's macchiato. Spelt wrongly, so um, some people don't like cute names for libraries, but we've got like Phoenix and Spirit and Fusion, and I guess we have all the cute names. Uh, Robert Ramy doesn't like cute names for libraries because it doesn't say what it does, but you know, it's got an M, a Q, and two T's in it, right? So I think we're pretty good. <laughs> so if you're interested in the library, um, it is um, going to be on GitHub very shortly. Uh, there is a readme there, so you can actually at least subscribe to then Git when it posts. Um, if nothing else, you might see some techniques inside there that will help you out with your embedded work. Um, in a few minutes, we'll take some questions. Right.
problem with one type. So I was wondering, like in all the examples that you have there, uh, probably because it's a small size, you really can handle errors. But in production systems that you design, right. what error can you really be used if you do not have errors? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question basically is, uh, so with Spirit, it is lots of types after types. The way Spirit works is that um, each of those things that we set up on the slides was a type and there was an operator in between it and then another type. Uh, those will compose at compile time to produce a new type, which will then have some operator that will then compose with that to produce a new type. And by the end of all of that, you've got this type that is super duper long, right? Um, so first of all, we turned off RTTI, so we have no runtime type information. So we're not going to get the bloat of holding that around because we don't care. But the, the main part of your question is we don't, we're not handling um, what's called an expectation point in spirit, which means that A, if you have A um, and then instead of um, the right shift operator, you just have like the greater than sign, it, and then B, it would mean that B must follow A, otherwise you have a problem. And thus we didn't actually, we had no expectation points. So one of the things we did is we, to get away from this is we designed the grammar to not have expectation points. And at the end of the parse, we look to see, because what will happen is the parse will fail, as opposed to throwing an exception, it will fail, and we will look to see whether or not we have consumed um, the begin to the end. So how much of the input buffer have we consumed? We should consume it all, because we know where the begin to the end buffer is for message uh, delimination. Uh, have we consumed it or not? If we didn't consume it, it's an error. And then we handle it as a parse error at that point. So yeah. For all the serializations that way. For the back insert or what? Yeah, right. So, no. So what happens is, is we, um, if something throws, then it goes to a single handler, and things are just bad at that point. Yeah. Did you link in the st uh, standard library statically? Question is, did we link in the static library statically? Yes, because it's just running on bare, well, I was bare wire. About the size because SVD vector is thirty k. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.